Hi, everyone. You're in the right place. As you can see, the numbers are mounting. We're waiting for people to sign in. This is the Climate Bonds webinar about electric utilities criteria that we have recently launched. I'll give it just a couple minutes more for everyone to log on, and then I'll introduce our friends on the on the panel and uh, then turn it over to Ana diaz Vaquez, who's going to give us a bit of an introduction first to kick off the discussion. Yes, indeed, Sean. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're going to get going at this point. Now, this webinar, which is being uh, broadcast in Zoom, does have a Q&A function. So if you've got questions, everyone, as we go along, please do type in questions into the Q&A and uh, I will pick them out as appropriate or we'll answer them in text. Any of our speakers can have a look at the Q&A and they might answer. Some, someone types in, what is CDBQ doing something this? Then Felix Antoine may well answer. You might be lucky. Um, I can't promise anything. All I can say is we will attempt to answer all questions. Please put them in and we'll weave them in. Uh, this webinar is also being broadcast live in LinkedIn, where the bulk of our listeners and viewers are for these things nowadays. Just so you know, it will be recorded and be available on our website afterwards, should you want to recommend it to a friend to have a look at. I hope you will, because it's really cool, this, this topic. You know the problem we face around drastically, dramatically, frighteningly reducing emissions. The IEA uh, has laid out a net zero plan for the energy sector or pathway trajectory, which really has some very drastic conclusions as the interpretation of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's call for drastic reductions to maintain or hold temperatures at 1.5 degrees, which is the sort of target we're looking at. And I want to stress, it's not really a target, it's a minimum threshold. If we go beyond 1.5 on a consistent basis, uh, we have real problems facing our ability to be able to survive on this planet. We will go well beyond 1.5. We're in a fight now to get it back down to 1.5 for sequestration emission reductions. Ay, 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 ay. We all know the biggest problem is energy and electricity. Well, we are making progress on electricity. In two years ago, we had this extraordinary figure where 90% of investment in electricity generation globally was clean. 90%. That is amazing. However, we've got a lot of existing assets. We've still got to work and squeeze out of the system as we can financially and so on. And this takes work. This takes support from governments, enabling energy policy is critical. We still have energy policy that frankly needs reforms in too many parts of the world and so on. But whatever, we are going to need to increase electrification of the planet. We think we're going to have to do something like quadruple electrification by 2050 when we think of the range of things that we have to start doing with electricity on the best scenarios we have now. Electric vehicles, all going to be electric in urban areas. Uh, heating, all going to be electric everywhere. Uh, cooling, of course, is already electric, but cooling is ballooning, mushrooming, because we have increased wealth in emerging markets and with increased wealth comes a desire to have temperature control, as you would appreciate if you're living in Lagos or Singapore. So for all of these reasons, the forward trajectory of electricity utilities is incredibly important. Now, what we've done here is provide some criteria to support the certification of financial instruments that go towards investing in electrical utilities in the context of this idea of transition, this exciting, important, viscerally important idea that we've got to change the world. We need to look at the pathways for transition going forward. And this is a, a big area of growth. We expect to see some transition instruments. We've already seen them in Asia. More importantly, though, we're seeing transition plans becoming mandatory in some countries, being linked to finance. Thai banks have been asked the central bank to issue transition, to have transition finance instruments available by the end of the year, and so on. Regulators are pushing. Investors are asking. So we're looking at guidance to what is a credible transition. That's what today is about. 
Thank you for joining me. I have with me uh, Agnes Gook, who is the head of sustainable capital at BNP Paribas, and uh, who is a I have to say is a great friend. We've been we've been talking, working, plotting for a long time now on this topic, and has been a champion of this whole this whole effort within the BNP Paribas universe, supporting their clients. And then Felix Antoine Prevost from CDPQ, the Cas de Pan. The, uh, uh, sorry, Philly, it's not hard. I always forget the full name. Uh, three letters, not four, please, everyone, of acronyms. The CDBQ, though, is a public sector fund in Quebec. And I have to say, as an, an asset owner in the parlance, I have to say, has been incredibly focused on addressing climate for many years now and has been a great partner of ours in working this and using some of our tools and so on, but also been driving, like the, the India investment strategy is you know, fantastic. Their, their commitment to pushing green hydrogen is fantastic. So we'll hear more about that in, in a minute. And then Ana diaz Vaquez, who's our head of energy at Climate Bonds, who has been leading the work on this topic. And at that point, I segue over to Anna. Give us a bit of introduction to this topic. Thank you, Sean. That was a great introduction. I will share my screen now. So I can want to lead you through the presentation. It will be short because I want to leave room for questions. I already see some interesting question in the Q&A. So thank you so much. So let me first, so you, I'm sure you see my screen. Let's go there. Let me first tell you that I am, as Sean said, I'm the head of energy transition and climate bonds. And I was developing this criteria with Paco Moreno, which is also in the audience. So hello, Paco. So this is this is the electrical utility criteria. So why we are developing that? We have already developed criteria for the different technologies producing electricity, solar, wind, marine, all of them. So we want to have an entity approach. So what if we have a portfolio of electricity production system and we can assess that as an entity. So that, that will be the electrical utility criteria. So let's go. This criteria goes from entity certification, as I already saw you, told you, and use of process bonds for retrofitting fossil fuel plants and environmental impact access. Let's go for the criteria for entity certification. So this is the scope of the criteria. You can see here the segment we are assessing the electricity generation portfolio together with the electricity purchase from the grid for distribution or trading in the market. So the portfolio generation and the market. We have another criteria also you can see in our website for transmission and distribution and for, and for storage. And also we have different criteria for end users. So you, this is all available in our website. So how do we develop the certification? First, we have two tiers of certification transition and alignment. So if this is the pathway of the sector, in this case, we are talking about the power sector, but this is a generic pathway. You can have a company Y that goes under the pathway all the way long from now. So then you are aligned. Or you can have a company set who just reached the pathway uh, before 2030. Then you are transitioning and there's also transition and certification for that. So the electricity utility criteria have three main steps and I will drag you through those today. So there is step one, meeting the pathway. What is meeting the pathway? So we ask, does the entity emissions intensity meet the sector pathway by now or by the end of 2030? And I will let you know who is the emission intensity the sector that we have choose after this slide. Steps two will be what is what is going on with the system capacity? What, what are there any caveat? Are there any activities or criteria going for those? Or what happened with the new capacity of the utility criteria? And then of course the step three will have some further cross-cutting criteria. We will go through that through the presentation. So don't worry. And if any question, please don't hesitate to ask. First steps, meeting the pathway. What is the pathway? The pathway, as I told you, is the uh, emission intensity pathway has been established based on the IEA net zero roadmap. This is the 23 update. This is the pathway. So you can see here the numbers, the 
emission intensity is the indicator, is the KPI. So we have gram of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So you see what are the emissions that are allowed in 2025, 2030, and we reach zero around 2041-42 because electricity electricity needs to be zero before 2050 because it's that enable to decarbonize the rest of the sectors. That's what Sean was already uh, discussing. So we will use the decarbonization of the electricity system ahead of the industry or to the transport sector in order to enable their transition. So that is why this is the pathway. What is that? You can see here, this is scope one. So those are the dead combustion emissions. Let me go a deeper, I have a deeper view on that. So the pathway of emission intensity put together combustion emissions, so scope one, not including biomass combustion emissions. You will see that after. Those are in, in the second steps. Then we have a scope three, electricity portion. So we have also emission related to the electricity purchase from the grid. All these under the greenhouse gas protocol. So that is the first steps, okay? Let's go to the second steps, which are what happened with the existing capacity and with the new capacity. Because as you see in the first step, we only look at the scope one emission, combustion. So what happened with the rest? You can see here for the step two technologies criteria, we can have existing capacity before the certification or new capacity after the certification. Let's go, what are the criteria for the existing capacity? So benchmark to decarbonize existing- Anna, Anna, Anna yes. just, just for a second, there's a lot of information here, folks. Um, this will all, these PowerPoints will all be available afterwards. I want to just give Felix Antoine and Agnes the opportunity, should they wish, to ask questions as we go. But but I've got a question. Can you take me back to the previous slide for a minute? Sure, sure. Uh, so this is a pathway of emissions that a utility can have over time to qualify as a aligned or a transition entity. Aligned means you're underneath this line. Transition means you're getting out of this line in a certain time. Have I got that right? Yeah. That, that was this one. Sorry. That was this one, exactly. So okay. you can so, so be the point, aligned. The, 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 the key point for electricity utility is, is to qualify. You're not expected to be called clean energy now. You have to have a plan to become clean energy. That's the point. That's the headline for all of this. And there's detail here to look at the plan. And the main thing is when it's in line at the IEA net zero pathway, that's the essence system. And then you can get a label, which will help you dip raising the capital market. We'll hear from Felix Antoine in a minute about his view about this to qualify that your transition plan is in line with 1.5 degrees, what we've got to do. That's, so, that's, that, that's very interesting. It's indeed, it's a transition criteria. We assess the transition. So you can start here, but we will see where are you heading and how you head there, how you go there. So this is a transition criteria. So it will be linked to, to sustainable link mode, sustainable link depths and things like that. That's what is that, okay? Okay, Thank and, you. and and I, I, and just, just one minute, Agnes, I'm thinking pretty well every utility, certainly in the Western world, has now looking at a transition plan and is going to be interested in the idea of being assessed and getting invalidated or looked at by the party. Is that a reasonable supposition? What's your view of what the market is is doing? Yeah, and I think it's um, it's interesting in, in your introduction, effectively, you were mentioning credible transition plan. Yeah? So if you look at um, everything that is being put into place, that's very much true in Europe, but across the world, there is that notion of okay, more and more entities will have to disclose their transition plan. And then in a lot of places, you have this reference to credible transition plan. But the big question is, what does a credible transition plan mean? Yeah? And to different people today, it can mean different things. So there, there is definitely a need for a clear frame, effectively, within which investors, but all stakeholders more generally, can assess okay, for a given entity, what they are presenting to me, is it indeed a credible transition plan? 
uh, and against what am I going to assess it? So for me, this is where effectively your approach and, and the entity level uh, methodology is very useful. Um, and, and the graph that you were showing earlier, Anna, indeed, uh, and will come later yet yeah, to kind of the type of instrument that have been used in the market when you look at spin killing bonds, for example. Definitely uh, for um, a company that operates within, within the electricity generation space, there is that element of usually 2030 targets being used in the bond, and you will want to show that they are on an ideal pathway for that 2030 um, target. So this is really all complementary. But to me, the cornerstone is, okay, how do you define a credible transition plan? And, and to me, that's where the methodology is, is very useful. Mm. That's, that's what we're going Anna, let me, we'll come back to the PowerPoint in a minute, if I may. And, and, sure. and by the way, li listeners, my panellists are always, always driven mad by the fact that I try and break it up into a conversation every so often. But I've just got interested in this and I just want to hear if that's all right. Um, Felix Antoine, investor, investor view about this issue of credibility. I mean, how are you currently assessing credibility? Because I know that's been a concern of you before we get back to Anna explain more detail of what we're doing yeah yeah so for, for sure maybe i can explain a, a bit in, in advance how cpq is working so we're a global investor based in quebec with around 430 billion canadian dollars in assets uh, we invest across five asset classes private equity public markets um uh, real billions estate. billions of dollars i just want everyone to this is a big fund yeah, yeah, and and one, for one of our uh, asset class infrastructure, uh, we're the largest global investor in, in the world. Uh, and most of our investments are, are private and internally managed. Uh, so that gives us quite a good control on, on them and thus allows us to really exercise leadership with, with regards to climate change. Um, so we have quite an ambitious uh, climate strategy looking to 2030, and it is based on four pillars. The first one is to reduce our total carbon portfolio intensity by 60% compared to 2017. The second is to complete our exit from oil production by 2022. We were uh, one of the only major institutional investors to enact so quickly on, on this front. Uh, we also plan to invest $54 billion in uh, low carbon investments by 2025. And by the end of this year, so a couple of months ago, we were at 53 billion. So almost at target wow. two years in advance, yes. Um, it, so these, these investments include real estate, renewable energy and transportation, but also emerging sectors such as energy storage and efficiency or, or uh, green, uh, green hydrogen. And lastly, and we can dig on more uh, on this uh, later, but we have a, a transition envelope, which is a, a specific tool designed to finance companies operating in high emitting sectors and sectors that we believe are key to the transition and that, and that will still exist in a low carbon uh, economy. So for the last two pillars, green assets and transition assets, uh, what, what Anna just presented, uh, we, we have aligned our investments on the CBI's taxonomy uh, more broadly. And, and really relying on the, on the CBI, an external credible organization and health has allowed us to, to really reduce our, rep our reputational risk, which is a, a very real risk in our industry, uh, but really move a step further and, and, and turn the subject into an opportunity. Well, Agnes, that's what we want to hear, opportunity. Um, the, what is our clients? Your clients and my contacts want to hear. Uh, Anna, take us back to that slide now, the IEA pathway slide, which is so such an important underpinning to everything. Sure. I go there. Let me go there. Not here. There. So these are the phase out. This is the, the key point about this is um, understanding phase out timetables. Tell us what mm -hmm. we're looking at. Yep. But I think one of the elements that Anna touched upon, and, and that's why this sector in particular is very important, because it's a starting point for decarbonization of many other sectors, in particular high emitting sectors. Um, and interestingly, so what we do in, in our team day in day out is restructuring stable bonds, a lot of them being green bonds. 
And when you think of all the green bonds for EVs, for rail, as you well know, and Anna, we really focus on, okay, EV vehicles, rail, um, being electri- effectively everything being re- electrified, electrified, we take as a big assumption that the electricity system is going to decarbonize. Um, and that's really what you need if you want the end result of the electrification of all the other sectors. So, so uh, the table is actually showing you that quite clearly that you need net zero in this sector way ahead of the other sectors. Uh, and, uh, you know, critical really have this type of methodology, um, I guess, ahead of time being rolled out from, from, from your side. That's very interesting. Yeah. You're totally right, uh, Agnes. That's exactly what it is. Okay, uh, so... Uh, uh, Anna, we've got a question in the in the chat about um, the IEO coal target for developing economies phase out is 2045. The CBI is saying 2040? And is there yes, a reason for that difference? This 45 was brand new. In fact, uh, the, we developed that last year. So it was based on the IEA to 2040. But let, let me add something. At the G7 meeting in Italy last week, energy minister from some of the highest emitted country reached a deal to phase out coal fire power plants by 2030-2035. And so we are totally aligned with that. But that's true. So IA changed depending on the scenarios, but we are a stick of that because if you need to reach net zero in 2040, so ahead of that, I don't think you have time if you reach net zero in 2045, but we will have a review of these criteria in a couple of years, probably. So that will come. But yes, that's, that's the new IA. This is bright new, and we finished that aligned with IA last year. Uh, which is something for everyone to be aware of. The, the science keeps staying, particularly with geographical um, differentiation around pathways. It doesn't mean that if you're in a country, especially a rich country, you're suddenly going to get, because you're special, a, a, a free pass to keep emitting uh, and avoid making severe changes. It all means making severe and substantial changes as quickly as possible. But there is more work going on now about ge- geographical differentiation around the world, and you'll see more developing guidance in this particular area. But for the moment, this is what applies for CBI certification. That's Please, correct. Anna. And, and Sean, this is, in fact, this is the only case when we have regional differentiation, when we come to talk about coal, because you see for gas, we have the same and oil of not, but for coal is when we make this differentiation. But don't forget, these criteria are targeting entities, not countries. So this is a huge difference. So when we developed that in the technical working group and the industrial working group, that was our stakeholder when we developed the criteria, this this issue came along a lot, many, many times. So at the end, we agree in just having this differentiation in regions just for coal phase out, because it makes sense for us. And that was an agreement in the technical working group and not to use different pathways for different regions. But at the end of the day, we are assessing companies here, entities here. So let me say we were in the assist. What happened with the existing capacity? So a company wants to get certified today. What happened with the capacity that they have? And this have to do with what Felix and Agnes were, were talking. What make a pathway credible? So this is what we ask you. If you have already existing capacity of fossil fuel, this is what you have to do. Phase out 30, 40. And it's not you need to go fighting with 100% low carbon fuels by 35, by 40, or retrofitting with CCS with a carbon capture rate of 90%. Something similar would go for gas. I don't want to spend more time here. We will we will share this, this slide. Also to say, and last, last week also, the CCS in existing power plant, the requirement for the electrical utility criteria for advanced economies is to capture at least 19% by two, 2035, aligned also more or less with the new AU regulation, what they say in the EPA, that by April 25, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency finalized a strong new pollutant standard for coal plants and new natural gas facility, requiring plants to capture nearly all their carbon emissions by 2032. So again, we're aligned with the 
meeting us with for the G7 countries, but also with the EPA in the United States pollution standard. So that's how aligned we are with what is going on today in the power sector. Let me go on. We don't have only fossil fuel plants. So in existing plant, we can have also some low carbon technology. So you can see here, what are the scope one emissions? So in solar or wind are automatically eligible. So we don't have a scope one or two, uh, three accountability. Hydropower, there is a threshold of 100 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hours. Those are mainly the methane emission coming from the reservoirs. And scope three is ineligible. The same for geothermal. And if we come to talk about bioenergy and BEX, there's no direct emission, so no scope one for biomass, but you can have a scope three emission from processing and transport the biomass. And it's easy to also meet the cross-cutting criteria. There is also a question, the first question in the chat, and I just saw why we don't have nuclear here, because we don't have criteria for nuclear. We consider nuclear as a low carbon generation system, but we don't have criteria for those. All these criteria are taken for the different technology criteria that we have already developed. Unfortunately, we haven't developed criteria for, for nuclear. So we know nuclear, we consider nuclear as a low carbon, so it will meet the pathway, but we don't have a specific criteria in terms of a scope one or three for nuclear. But, but hang on, that's an incredibly important point. It so is. nuclear qualifies that it is low carbon, everyone understands. <clears throat> and we do allow nuclear bonds in our use of proceeds, green bonds tackling. While we don't have specific criteria, it does not mean they're not includable in the uh, emissions trajectory pathway. So EDF would be able to do something here, for example, well, it's a fairly, fairly low carbon company anyway, but a, a company that had a mixed portfolio would still qualify. That's exactly correct. That's, I just want, want to explain why we don't have a threshold for nuclear. That's, that's the case. Great. Okay, let's go. What happened? We see what happened with the existing capacity, what the capacity the entity has. What happened with the future capacity? What is the new capacity? What are the criteria for this new capacity if they want to uh, be certified and follow with the transition pathway that we have designed? So there's no in new investment for fossil fuels. Only there is a possibility to switch under some security and supply criteria from coal to gas in an Iceland. And this is very restricted. One is even restricted than the EU taxonomy. And this has happened in very few, it will happen in very few cases. But here it is, we were thinking about an island where they want to substitute a coal power plant by gas and they have issues to produce, to, to assure security and supply. So saying that, in general, there's no new, the new capacity cannot be fossil fueled. And those are the thresholds for new capacity for low carbon technologies. Again, solar and wind are automatically eligible. Bioenergy will have a scope three, now it's 50, and it's also 50 for the hydropower and geothermal technologies. And the scope three for those two are ineligible. Again, no criteria for nuclear. So step three, cross-cutting criteria. So we see we need to follow the pathway. We need to know what's going on with the existing capacity and with the new capacity. But now let's see, there's also some adding cross-cutting criteria and I will end with that. So there is some cross-cutting criteria for carbon capture and storage, for hydrogen, for biomass, and for methane leakage. And I will leave it here. So CCS, we have some criteria following the taxonomy because we don't have already a specific criteria for carbon capture and storage in CBI. So we just follow the leakage needs to be below 5% for transport, storage, and utilization. For hydrogen is the same. We have greenhouse gas threshold from trend to zero in production and delivery. And this is embedded in our hydrogen criteria developed by Marian, a colleague. And we have also for the bioenergy criteria this is the threshold that you already see. This is the threshold link to production and transport. So what are the emissions embedded in the biomass that you put at the door of the power plant? And then, of course, we have metal leakage in fossil fuel gas, and the, uh, which means if you are using fossil fuel gas, you need to have some uh, caveat in terms of the metal leakage. So just very fast, as I told you, carbon capture and store 35% of the mass of the CO2 transport are the limits, storage, the same for storage, and also for the utilization, there are also some criteria here. 
uh, hydrogen. You see here, this is the hydrogen production and delivery pathway. So if you are using green hydrogen, th those are the emission embedded in the hydrogen produced and delivered at the door of the power plant. Those are based on the CBI, or the climate bonds hydrogen criteria. This is for biomass. So there are some cross-cutting criteria in terms of what is the biomass allowed. So the sources of biomass allowed. We need to reduce the risk of indirect land use changes, climate risk assessment, food security assessment. And there is the greenhouse gas emission threshold, as I told you. And there is also some emission related to the process. Those are emission related to the processing, transport, and distribution. The same for methane leakage. So we need to, this is following the youth taxonomy. So detection and repair of the methane in the transportation and in the use. And that is pretty much. So then we have bonds as shown, say, for carbon capture and storage with a requirement 90% carbon capture rate. And also for low carbon fuel co-firing, this is the co-firing rate of 100%. Again, this is, can be also used as a use of process for bonds. In This can be used when you are blending hydrogen in a gas turbine, and then you can reach at 100% of green hydrogen in a gas turbine, uh, shifting the, the fossil fuel with green fuel. And then at the end, there is only to say that there's also some environmental impact assessment that we are following for example, for the hydropower, we are following the hydropower sustainability standards for the International Hydropower Association. And there's also some adaptation and resilient criteria to demonstrate compliance. The certificate entity must undertake a risk assessment, including the identification, planning, and implemented measures to manage and mitigate the climate risk without harming the resilience of the surrounders. This is also following the taxonomy and our own resilience criteria that we are developing. And at the end, also environmental assessment in hydropower and bioenergy needs to follow bioenergy criteria developed by climate bonds and also the geothermal criteria as I say, developed by climate bonds. So this is in a nutshell, the utility criteria. I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think, Felix Antoine, we might start with you. Um, opportunities in this, you've given us a sense of what you, how do you see this and, um, and where do you see the opportunities and of course the risks? Um, yeah, so, so we have a dual mandate. Uh, which is to achieve optimal financial performance for our depositors, which are mostly pension and insurance funds, um, and also to uh, contribute to Quebec's economic uh, development. So, of course, uh, within this mandate, there's the sustainability and, and more spe uh, specifically in, in supporting electrification. So you mentioned in, in the intro, Sean, um, the IEA, the IEA expects global electricity demand to rise to rise at about 2.5 percent annually through 2026, and as uh, clean ele electricity supply expands, um, the share of fossil fuels in glo uh, global generation is expected to to decline from about 61 percent now to 54 uh, percent in 2026. This is a, a very short period of time. Um, we see countries putting policies in place and climate changes included in industrial policy in, in some states, for example, in, in the U.S. Uh, for, for sure, it's, it's, a, it's a public policy is key here, obviously, but we're seeing progress on this front. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this translates into opportunities. Um, in fact, about 40% of our low carbon investments are in renewable energy. And for these, these investments, the annualized rate of return has been 18% over the last five years on the on the five-year horizon, which is uh, which is significant. So, for sure, there's risk, uh, regulatory, operational, but really having a long-term view is really what brings a, a competitive advantage. So that's a pretty good story of success in a sector. Uh, Agnes, is are you seeing this amongst your client base moment? Is there an appreciation of this change story? And what do you see as the biggest opportunities and of course risks? So, so on the um, on the sector and, and looking at the NTC level, I think what is really important to note is first 
Um, when you look at sustainable finance specifically, utilities and, and electricity generation by large have been the bulk of issuers in the green bond space. Now, going forward, you can think, okay, they will need to finance more. Uh, you can have some utilities um, in other geographies that might want to look at broader ways of financing. You have the equity as well. What do you you know, need to do with that. And the entity level is, to me, the approach is very useful from different perspectives. So as you know, at BNP Parva, we, we are at the XCOM of the ICMA principles. And so, so we very much follow the climate transition finance handbook approach that, you know, you look at entity and then you, you move into potentially an instrument being stability linked bond or use a proceed transaction. But the cornerstone is, okay, what is your strategy at entity level? And, and there is a lot of opportunities for issuers and investors to get further clarity on that. I was, I was mentioning, you know, different credible transition plans. How do you interpret them? Um, so having additional or having greater transparency is a big opportunity because everyone will feel more comfortable effectively to either come to sustainable finance market or actually be able to tag in some portfolios like Felix, Antoine, even conventional bonds or equities, if you have greater transparency, greater readability effectively of what you are holding. Um, and so for me, I see it two ways. Yeah, it's either an add-on if you look at stable finance, whether it's SLB, whether it's user proceeds, and you can argue in some geographies user proceeds have taken the form of green bonds, some transition bonds. So it really helps effectively bring more transactions with a lot more credibility, but also further down the line. And, and that's why different investment managers will look at different strategies. You could think that those entity level certification will be helpful for all conventional debts. Effectively, you'll be able to classify it for an investor a lot better. You know, am I investing in an entity that is aligned as you were showing? So already under a net zero path or at an SEO pathway? Am I investing in an entity that is in transition? So according to your methodology, is on an SEO pathway by 2030. Uh, and it would be true of equity as well, where they could use that. Um, of course, it means a lot more companies and entities effectively applying that methodology, but that, that's effectively the idea behind it. So to me, it's really, it's a big opportunity from a lot of different perspectives, uh, but the fundamental behind it is you provide more transparency um, and credibility effectively to what you bring to the market, both for issuers and investors. You've been you've been very active in things like the Green Bond Principles Committees, etc. In this discussion of transition finance and transition plans in Europe. Um, which is now becoming de rigueur, Europe, UK, and, and numerous other countries. Um, do you see this as being already having a material effect on encouraging greater work in this area and driving ambition? Or have we got a lot, has the market got a lot to catch up yet with the, the sort of discussions that you've been having at a committee level? Mm -hmm. But on, I mean, in terms of ambition, so we, we had a bit of a discussion, yeah, we were preparing. The, the, the big question, and, and I mean, difficult to resolve it, yeah, is going to be how do you define ambition level taking into account regional specificities, yeah, so that, that was a discussion we we're having. So that's going to be really how do you get everyone to feel comfortable, how fast they want to move forward. Uh, so the way I always look at it is similar to EU taxonomy. EU taxonomy has a lot of detractors <laughs> because it's complex, because yeah, it could be improved in, in, in many places. But the big difference I've seen is at least we have, when it comes to activities, a guidebook that all of us know effectively, all the relevant stakeholders know, and then we can argue, are we in agreement with it or how far are we from it and that's where i think kind of methodologies are useful maybe you will have some region that say no i don't quite agree <laughs> with the cdi methodology of in transition but at least you can you have a common a common starting point for the discussion and then you can you can see you know do you bring on the gap or not so, so it's useful from more than one perspective to demonstrate ambition even for those that will say actually i cannot align to that methodology 
you will be able to say, okay, how far are you? And where do you deviate? And that's where Anna, you know, was showing the different technologies. That's really useful because then you can show, okay, so map to your technologies and see already straight away the gap. Actually, I have one point on technologies. Um, there is an interesting question in the q and I wonder, Anna, if you want to take it, I'm happy to say a bit about it. But there is a question why does new fossil fuel not count if it is abated, for example, with CCUS? So maybe that's useful to, I mean, the, the, the way I would look at it is definitely, yes, abated is better than non abated, but the bulk of emissions come from the use of the product, not actually from the extraction. And abatement, that's what it addresses, yeah, extraction, extraction processing, not, not the end use. but um that, that's just my comment on it i don't know i know if you want to add from this that, that's, that's great I, I bet pretty much we don't allow for new capacity fossil fuel because we are going towards a low carbon economy so and this is even though you are paid but first the technology is not totally mature so we need to see what is going on how is can what is going to happen with the scale up ccs and also the co-fighting we hope that this is going to happen and we are very sure that that will be some solution for some countries with a high rate of coal power coal power plants today and they need to reduce their emissions so we allow this type of technologies but not allow new fossil fuel capacity I don't know, Sean, you want to add something to that? Well, I, Agnes covered it quite well, but you know, it, it, this may change. Look, it's possible. You know, At the end of the day, what we're concerned about is getting emissions down very, yep. very fast, very, very quickly. Where we are now, we don't see new being consistent and so on. But we have to be agnostic about the solutions because at the end of the day, as we all know, it's emissions account how we do it. We have some challenges with CCS improving. We've got a lot of things we've got to apply CCS for. Industrial sector, for example, vast, necessary, urgent applications. So starting to look at CCS for new, which is, be, which is uh, new fossil fuel, which we've been talking about for 15 years, it frankly looks like a furphy and one that we've chosen not to tackle at this stage. But nothing's ever off the table as technologies mature. If it looks like it's very necessary to go forward, as I said, the, the real guide is emissions reductions pathways. So it's not removed. It's just not there at this stage. Prove it, folks, prove it, because at the moment we don't have a lot of proof, I'm afraid, when it comes down to fossil fuels using CCS. It's like um, been one of those dreams for the last 20 years which have um, failed to come fully true so far. Yeah. Am I crazy, Felix Antoine? What do you think? I, I would agree. I think uh, maybe I want to echo a, a question uh, pointed out by Rob and maybe provide a, a, a real world example of how to support the decarbonization of, of a company and provide really an assessment of, of credible uh, transition plans. So as I mentioned, we've, we've established a transition envelope, which is specifically designed to finance companies in, in high emitting sectors, including the utility sector. So when evaluating potential investments for inclusion in this, in this envelope, we follow a very rigorous process. And, and our assessments uh, realize on the CBI's transition principles and, and hallmarks. Uh, these, assessments, these assessments are externally validated uh, to ensure uh, greater transparency. And, and the assessments uh, really cover company targets to ensure that the overall uh, tra trajectory is Paris aligned but also it covers strategy, capital allocation, as well as governance uh, structure. So maybe let me illustrate this with a, with a real world example. Um, we recently worked with RS Indiana, which is a, a US electricity provider that, um, that transmits, uh, that generates, transmits and distributes electricity to more than 500,000 customers um, in the state of Indiana in the US. Uh, the company had quite an ambitious plan uh, that was centered around two key components. Um, one was to optimize its transmission and distribution uh, operations. Um, so the company aimed to enhance the, the efficiency of its transmission lines in order to reduce um, energy losses and to improve overall um, system reliability. 
And the second uh, component was, uh, was really transitioning from coal to renewables. So the company committed to really phasing out its coal-fired generation units by 2025 and investing heavily in renewables in order to have a 1.3 gigawatt capacity added, added capacity uh, by 2027. So this, this dual strategy of, of RS Indiana uh, to decarbonize both its operation and the, the energy uh, it delivered to end users made a, made a good case for our, our envelope. And, and the CBI played a, a crucial role uh, in this process, really, because by, by providing clear guidelines, as, as Agnes mentioned, um, it helped us to ensure that, that the transition plan was, was rigorous enough. And on a higher level, it allowed us to really work with intentionality. And, and what I mean by this is, yes, seeking adequate returns, but also investing with an intentional desire to contribute to beneficial uh, environment to environmental benefit. Thank you. Agnes, a slightly different question. This is all we will talk about these criteria and these are sort of transition investments, but uh, we've got CDPQ as a um, as a, a leader in this particular area. How broad is this appetite across the investor community for these kind for the sorts of investments which are more complicated when we're looking at transition pathways? At this stage, what's what's your reading? Well, okay, it's difficult to put a number of a number on it, but you know, if you look high level, a lot of investors have subscribed to the net zero uh, asset owner or asset manager alliance. So that effectively means decarbonization of portfolio. So when you start from that premise, you know that effectively, yes, today if you see in Europe, you have. So far, this Article 6, 8, and 9, you know that Article 6 doesn't really kind of encompass, you know, any meaningful, let's say, ESG features within Article 8 and Article 9 very much, but even within a lot of Article 8, very often, you know, Article 8 plus, they are kind of, you know, colloquially named, you will have really a key focus on decarbonization of the portfolio. Um, and of course, when you look at that, some will be able to have really net zero, close to net zero investments. The reality of our economy is that this is still a small part of what is available for investment today. And in reality, most of what investors will need to kind of see through um, is, okay, who are the entities, which are the entities that are presenting me with really an aim and, and, and a meaningful really strategy to decarbonize. Um, and so this is where this, you know, word of transition is, is coming into the picture. I'm saying, well, because at the moment, very people have very, very different meaning, but you, you will see that eventually most investors will talk to you today about transition. Where I think it's important, and I don't think we, we've highlighted uh, in entity level um, methodologies, and so you've developed quite an extensive one, uh, and, and there are a few others outstanding today. Um, what is really important is different from a target certification. Um, so you will look at the target, but you will also look at what's the implementation plan. And by implementation plan is What's the business decisions you're making today? What is the financing required? Do you have a good idea of what it looks like? And what's your governance? And that's what is going to be really key for investors. It's not so much, okay, I shoot for a point in five years' time, and then, you know, let's all cross fingers that we are going to get there. And in five years' time, you know, we wonder what happened. So it, it's more and more, I mean, we had to start yeah, from setting numbers and, and a lot actually of companies will tell you, okay, you know, there are some targets, especially the longer you go, we don't have a full plan because technology don't even exist for some of them, but we need we to set a target to then effectively, you know, deploy R&D, deploy CapEx today to get there. But at least, you know, for the decisions that are being made today, you know, every all stakeholders needs to understand how credible, how realistic those decisions are going to be to deliver on the target. 
and where you know if you look five years back targets were already a bit of an innovation effectively in the market yeah. of course now we need to go one step beyond there's okay you have your target show me what you're doing to get there so we're doing in terms of business decision financing governance and and this is where i think it's, it's a whole new landscape and that becomes and, and i'll let phoenix maybe chime in but that becomes you know, effectively engagement, for example, for investors when it comes to decarbonization is more and more important. Really, you know, show me what's behind just the number that you've validated. You have a very broad remit in terms of sustainable capital markets. Um, we're looking, we're now offering entity certification as well as instrument certification through this process because a, a utility that meets the criteria can have a a, a line or a transition label as a utility, which for our listeners would mean that their potentially their debt would qualify, their their loans, bilateral loans, BNP Paribas does a lot of bilateral sustainable loans, for example, um, or their equity could qualify if they wanted the market as such. That's the nature of the labeling. Um, but this has largely been, Agnes, a debt focused um, story so far. Um, do you think the equity side, the recognition of equity, the the marketing and label, if you like, an extension of the green bond principles in a way, is a, is, is yeah. something that's gonna, we're going to see? Hmm. So there is, you know, the, I don't want to say the wrong way, I think it's for four, four exchanges. So they, they did publish kind of um, some equity principles. Interestingly, you know, the, the, what we were having discussions with some of our colleagues on, on this is equity really needs large coverage. Um, and that's why a lot of what has been done today is more through indices. Um, my, but okay, this is a more kind of a personal view is okay. If you look at credit rating today, most entities uh, that, you know, will have credit ratings, especially so if you are, if, if you have equity listed. So yes, it's early days. It doesn't look like, you know, it's going to be easy and quick to ramp up to have a decarbonization certification if you want on, on you know all the equity that is being traded but I, I would say you know I know let, let's meet again in five years time and, and it can maybe be different because yeah so far equities they there are some elements of like this green equity to be fair the principles look at green transition equities it's fairly broad but it's really okay I'm going to assess how much there is of capex or revenue that are green or that are transition um, and and you need effectively you know the ramp up has has been kind of still kind of limited um so yeah index base is what the equity marks but i would i wouldn't think it's it's going to be forever yeah you can have more kind of you know entity by entity trying to show the index is very much based on big data and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. Um, when it will be an issue, really requesting effectively a solicited entity certification, the issue will have effectively more ability to provide the, the exactly up-to-date data, I would say. Maybe if I Thank can add yes. a, a, maybe if I can add a point on, on equity, what we've been uh, using mostly on on the public markets is really the SBTI, there's the SBTI certified and SBTI committed. But really, uh, really what we've seen is large number of companies who committed, but eventually they had a, a two year period to really set targets and plans and they were um, eventually removed in March. There's a large number of companies who were removed from the list uh, made by SBTI quite recently. And it's really echoes i think the 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 situation now where where companies really uh, announce big targets and now it's time to deliver and and some companies have a have a more of a hard time to uh, to announce the the credible plans and, and partly that's because credible plans are tough because of the the climate targets that we have that we really need to achieve necessary for to create a sustainable future it, this is hard mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. one of the things we talk about it climate bonds a lot, is the need for a close working relationship between investors, corporates, and government. We're enabling policies, enabling energy policy, for example, uh, and other kinds of support as necessary, depending on the market, are really critical to allow corporations to be able to make the change. We only make the change if we can also pay pensions while we're doing it. 
and that requires us to make this financially viable going forward. And it's not always as simple as saying, okay, company, go away and just sort it out. It doesn't work that way. Not when we have to change society and our energy system at such an extraordinary pace and scale, which we're looking at now. And, um, you know, folks, if we'd started 30 years ago, we wouldn't need to see such a dramatic change. But it is what it is. We are where we are. We need to wrap up. Last thoughts, Antoine, uh, Felix Antoine, about the future. What's coming next? Yeah, oh, there's a lot to do. Uh, well, maybe I would say in the electricity sector, what we what we see as the next step is really um, grid resilience and adaptation to, to physical risk. We haven't had the chance really to discuss this so far, but um, we had a conversation recently with one of our portfolio company, a transmission and distribution operator based in New England. And the company was telling us that they were facing significant and increasing costs related to tree clearing uh, because wow. uh, because winter is warmer and summer is, is more humid. So uh, trees grow more rapidly. And especially in New England, there's been quite a few storms in the past two years. Uh, so the company has to invest heavily to uh, to um, to un for undergrounding lines and for storm hardening. Uh, so yeah, we, we see this as, an, as the next uh, challenge in, in this sector. I guess. Next. Yeah, and it's a little a bit of an in between, as Felix Antoine is saying. You were alluding to Sean. Yeah, there is a lot, a lot to do, but I, I think there is progress, though. Yeah, and we have um, a lot more clarity, I would say, on, on what needs to happen uh, than we had maybe even a couple of years back. Um, we have. I know you love opportunities, Sean, but <laughs> the realistic kind of. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it, it does kind of have, you know, but at the moment, of course, kind of, you know, increased cost of debt, you do have, and I think there were a few questions kind of maybe alluding to that on the Q&A. It, 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 how do we make sure effectively that the companies and, and, and stakeholders are large, are able to finance the transition? Um, so, so, you know, that's one piece of the puzzle, effectively, the, those new methodologies. To me, the be big benefit, it gives more clarity and including, you know, at the policy level, including, you know, market associations on, on okay, what do we do next? Yeah. Anna, last word. I've been answering the question in the Q&A, so not oh, really, good. I just, this is, we, we would like to see this, how it's operate, how you can it's be useful for, for you guys, also for the utilities. We want to see and, and get the feedback from the implementation of the, so for, for certifying with this criteria. We're looking forward to have the first samples. As I say, we have already some candidate and it will be great to see how it works. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much, Agnes and Felix. Antoine for having taken time out of your day in London and, and Montreal, and Anna for all the work you've done in convening our committees of experts that have created this. And it's very important to note, Client Bonds doesn't come to, with rules here. Client Bonds convenes experts who come up with the rules from around the world. Clearly, electricity, the energy sector is vitally important for decarbonisation and for welfare, for productivity, for the operation of our society, for well-being for all. We have to make this work. We have to make this work and clean. We are making it work and clean. The change has started happening. Absolutely. That 90% investment in clean energy just already a couple of years ago, but we need to speed things up now. There are other things that you'll see coming from us. Grids are really important. We need to massively increase grid connections globally, distributed and have been spoken in many places. Let's just see. That's the change. Whatever. We're going to electrify, electrify, electrify. You will see more guidance coming on different things like methane abatement. We're working on that at the moment, on what that means, because that's a really critical gas that we have to address in the short term, as in the oil and gas industry notably, uh, but in other sectors like agriculture as well. And you will see guidance coming through about resilience, because we, we hit 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, the World Meteorological Organ uh, Organization says by 2037 it'll be constant. So we have to prepare. We have to prepare for significant, substantial changes in hydrology, in storm weather, in the crop distribution, etc. 
There's a lot to be done, but the great news, the exciting thing is the global economy super tanker has started turning. Like the IRA, the Japanese plans, the European plans, the growth of the green finance markets beheaded by BNP Paribas and CDPQ and others, we are seeing an extraordinary change. Everywhere I go, like in the IMF meetings in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago, the topic is about climate finance, how to do it. We no longer get abstract conversations. It's an exciting time to be, but remember, speed now is of everything. We need to go faster, faster, faster. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you, Felix Tuan, for the work you're doing in leading this change and creating a better world for ourselves and our children and Anna as well. And thank you, everyone listening to this around the world for the work I know you're doing to create a better world for us, a world fit for our children. Good luck. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.